You may remain seated. Our sermon text is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I'll be reading through those verses during our sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Dear recipients of every good and perfect gift, a little child comes running into the kitchen holding the present in his hands that he's just unwrapped from grandpa and grandma that they just brought him. And in fact, grandpa and grandma are still taking their coats off at the front door, but yet he's got that present right out there in front of him. And he's so excited to show his mom what his grandpa and grandma brought him as a gift. Before he runs into the playroom to, be, to playroom to begin playing with that toy, his mom grabs him by the arm and says, Now what do you say? Thank you. How many times do you have to remind a child? How many times do you have to teach a child to say thank you? Five times? Ten? The biblical 77 times and they've got it down? And then yet still, when they're in their teens and you say, what do you say? Oh, thank you. Why do parents go through so much effort to teach their children? Because you do. You have to teach them to say thank you. It's not something that comes out naturally. Why do parents go through so much work? Why is it worth it? Why do we as a, a congregation, why do we as a nation take time out of this busy holiday schedule to stop here in church and say thank you to the Lord? Why is it that important? Do we, does God really need us to say thank you to him? Are we worried that if we don't stop in church or at least say a prayer on Thanksgiving to give thanks to God that he's going to stop our blessings from coming, that he's going to cut us off if we forget to say thank you? In these verses, for our meditation this morning from Holy Scriptures, Moses gives us plenty of reasons why we need to remember to give thanks. And he shows us here that thanksgiving is a blessing not for God. We're not here for, for God's good, but for ours. When we give thanks, it is a blessing to us. Moses wrote and spoke the words of the book of Deuteronomy to the children of Israel when they were just on the far side of the Jordan River, about to cross the river and go and knock down the walls of Jericho, as you remember, or, or shout and the walls fell down. He was preaching to a group of people that he was really saying goodbye to because he wasn't going to be able to lead them into the promised land of Canaan. But almost as a father speaks to his children, he was training them, he was teaching them and encouraging them to continue to live with the Lord in the land of Canaan after their lives had completely changed. He knew that things were going to be different for them in the land of Canaan, and he wanted them to remember God and his blessings, so he urged them and commanded them to give thanks. Not for God's sake, but for their own. Listen to these words of our text. Moses said, When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble you and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth 
and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. This is God's word. For 40 years, the Israelites had wandered around in the desert and lived in tents. And all of that time, they were so very directly dependent on God for their daily needs, almost as though he were feeding them like a child, hand to mouth. They didn't have to worry about where their food was coming from because every morning, except for Saturday morning, they woke up and there on the desert floor was manna for them to eat. God sent them quail when they needed meat. When there was no water to drink, he made water come out of the rock. They didn't have lots of things. They only had what they needed for that day. Remember, the manna would spoil if they tried to save it till the next day. All they had was what they had with them and what they needed for that day. Even the clothes that they were wearing. They didn't have all kinds of new clothes, but the clothes that they had, the old clothes they had, and the sandals that they had, the Bible tells us God made it a miracle so that they didn't wear out. When decisions needed to be made in their nation, what did the Israelites do? They brought those requests to the Lord, to Moses at God's tabernacle. And God would directly answer them through Moses or through the Urim and the Thummim, those, those casting lots that God would answer questions with. God dealt with the people directly and provided for their needs day in and day out. But when they moved into the land of Canaan, things were going to be different for them. On the whole, life was going to be a little bit smoother after they had defeated their enemies and God had defeated their enemies for them. They were going to live in fine houses. They were going to be able to amass wealth for themselves. They were going to have fields and flocks and herds that would grow. There would be vineyards there that were already planted and orchards with fruit already growing on them. They were going to have barns to store up the food that they didn't need for that very day. And life was going to be much more smooth for them. God was going to give them peace from all of their enemies. They wouldn't be as hand-to-mouth dependent on the Lord as they saw so vividly in the desert. And because of all those blessings, because of how, how nice of a life God was giving them, they were going to be in grave danger. Because of our sinful human nature, whenever we have an abundance of possessions, whenever we're not clinging for that next bite of food to the Lord, pride soon very quickly follows. And Moses warned the people, not if, but then, he said, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. How sinfully foolish and self-centered for us to take pride in the blessings that God brought into our lives? We should, shouldn't we so much be, be more willing to give thanks and credit to him? I heard a story, well, more of a joke, about a hunter who was up in his tree stand and he dropped an arrow accidentally out of his tree stand and killed an eight-point buck. That was meant to be a joke. It was told as a joke. But of course, when we think about it, isn't that really about the level, the extent of our involvement in the blessings that God brings into our lives? Even just using the illustration of hunting. Who is it that caused that fawn to be born? Who was the one who fed that fawn all throughout its life and caused it to grow into a large deer? Who was the one who kept that deer free from uh, predators free from disease and sickness? Who was the one who provided the weather that allowed the hunter to go out and hunt? Who was the one who provided that hunter with a, a, a government that allows him or her to own a firearm? Who was the one who controls the laws of physics that determines where that bullet or that arrow goes? Is it not all in God's control? Is it not all in his hands? All we do is sit there and wait and pull the trigger or let go of the string, and we take such pride in the animals that we hunt. Wouldn't it make so much more sense to give thanks to God for everything that he did? 
even just that one scenario. And many of the other blessings, all of the other blessings in our lives are the same way. The blessing of children that we have in our lives. It is, yes, a lot of hard work for a woman to to be pregnant and and to have a child, but think of all the miracle that God is doing, forming the the fingers and the eyes and the brain and the neurons and and making those, those body parts, those organs of the body work together. What an amazing miracle God is doing. We give thanks to God for these blessings. Moses reminds us in this text that it is God who gives us the ability to do any of those things, from hunting to raising children or anything in between. It's God who gives us the ability and not us. God is the one who brings every good blessing into our lives. And so to defend ourselves against the sinful pride that comes when we receive great blessings from God, Moses told the Israelites to do something. He told them when they get into the land of Canaan and their lives are filled with great blessings, they were to give thanks. Giving thanks was a defense against the sinful pride that often came with God's blessings. Moses said to them, Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Otherwise, your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. God had kept them humble and treated them like children as they wandered through the desert, reminding them every day of how dependent they were on him. And as their blessings increased, they would need to grow up from being children to being adult believers in the Lord. Those who who actively worked to, to make an effort to remember that all of the blessings that they had were blessings from the Lord God and not of their own making. And they would do that by giving thanks to God for all that he had given them. Whenever we gather together to pause and give thanks to the Lord, whenever we stop with our families, whenever we take a moment and recognize the gifts that God has given us in our lives, whether it's on Thanksgiving or any other day of the year, we are helping defend ourselves against sinful pride by remembering where our blessings truly come from. That's why it's healthy for us. That's why it's a blessing for us to give thanks to the Lord. And to remind all of the Israelites of the good things that God had done for them, all Moses had to do was take a little trip down memory lane. All he had to do was look back through the 40 years that they had been together from the time that he took over leadership of the nation back in Egypt. He recounted in these verses many times that God had come to their aid and provided everything that they needed. But something else we can learn as we look at the history of the Israelite people is what happens when we forget how good and gracious God has been to us. As the Israelites moved into the land of Canaan, as they received the many blessings that God had promised to them for generations, they failed to keep God's commandments. Even walking further and further away to him, from him, worshiping false gods from the nations around them. Now you and I don't have to bow down to an idol for us to demonstrate the fact and for others to see that we have forgotten where our gifts come from. We give plenty of evidence that we have forgotten where our gifts come from every time we sin against the Lord. Moses said, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to observe his commands and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they forgot where all of their great blessings come from, where this beautiful creation came from that they enjoyed and who, for whom God made that wonderful creation. And they showed that they forgot that by taking fruit from that tree and disobeying that command to not eat from this. Whenever we sin against God's commands, we demonstrate we have forgotten Him and His goodness to us. That every time we stop and give thanks, we remember the great things that He has done for us. And truly the list of our blessings, if we actually did sit down and try to list all of them, that list would be never-ending. We would never be able to make an end of it. 
But all of the material blessings that we so often focus on on Thanksgiving are merely examples of the greater and more valuable gifts that God has poured into our lives. You know, he, he freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, but he has freed us from slavery to sin and to the devil. He rescued them from death by the blood of the Passover lamb, caused the angel of death to pass over their houses. But he has rescued you and me by the blood of the true lamb of God, by which we are rescued from death, eternal death in hell. God brought them through the waters of the Red Sea by Moses' hand, by the hand of possibly some pastor or some other Christian, God has washed you in the waters of baptism and made you his own dear child. God has been very great to them, brought them to the edge of the promised land of Canaan, leading them through the vast and dangerous desert with its scorpions and snakes. But God has led each and every one of us through the wilderness of this life, through the temptations of the devil and the world around us, and brought us to the brink of our promised land of heaven and our eternal home. He forgives all of our sins, even our sins of thanklessness, and continues to shower his blessings on us, both material and spiritual. And through his word, he assures us of the home we have in heaven with him where we will enjoy all of his blessings for eternity. A regular regimen, a regular diet of thanksgiving is healthy for us. And it was healthy for the Israelites in the Old Testament too. You saw in that first lesson that we read from Deuteronomy also of how God so very explicitly and de gave details on how they were supposed to come and have their thanksgiving celebration. And then at the end he commands them to rejoice in all of the good things the Lord has given you. Regular praise and thanksgiving were part of the worship life that God planned for them. They're part of the worship life that God has planned for us. He gives us all kinds of opportunities. He isn't as detailed about this is how you have to give thanksgiving in the New Testament. He gives us many different ways for us to show our love and thanks and appreciation for what he has done. Giving our offerings, serving him, using our time and talents to play instruments for worship, singing and praising him, praying to him, showing love towards others that God has placed in our lives, taking care of the blessings that God has given us. All these and many more are countless ways that we show our thanks to God and live a life, not just words that we speak on Thanksgiving Day, but live a life of giving thanks to God. All of these things he wants us to do, not because we have to, but in the same spirit as the Old Testament Israelites, rejoicing in all of the good things your God has given you. It's interesting to note that Moses says in this text to the people of Israel that God blessed them so abundantly and took care of them so wonderfully in the desert to humble them. He said, to humble you and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Only when we combine God's great gifts to us with a thankful heart do those blessings achieve the purpose for which God wants them to be for us. That we would give thanks to him and trust in him and not be filled with sinful pride. See, it's not as though God needs our worship and praise. It's not as though he needs our offerings on his altar any more than he needed the Israelites to, to burn up bulls and lambs and goats on his altar in the Old Testament. It is us that needs opportunities like these to give praise and thanks to him. It is for our good that we give thanks to God for all of his blessings. We recognize his goodness that has sustained us yet again for another year and praise him for all the things he has given us which we don't deserve. And then clinging to him in humble thanks for all of these gifts, we can truly see how rich we are simply in the fact that we are able to call the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father. 
who abundantly supplies all of our needs. Yes, children need to be taught to say thank you. And even we as adult children of our Heavenly Father need to be reminded again and again to say thanks. That's why it's good for us to take this special day in November to say thanks to God and focus on that everyday task of thanksgiving. No one needs it more than we do. Until we stand before God's throne someday, where we will in his presence give him thanks for the blessings that he has showered on us all of our lives. That's right, thanksgiving is really just a small taste of what we will be doing in heaven, praising him and thanking him for all of his goodness to us. Now that's a good reason to give thanks today and every day of our lives. Amen. Amen.